All right, so good afternoon and welcome to the Scripps Technical Forum. I am Douglas Alden and I'm the lead engineer with the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes here at Scripps. In addition, I function as the STF chair and get assistance setting up and running STF from my colleagues here on campus, Gwen Nero and Vanessa Scott. Gwen is the Director of Corporate Affiliates, Business Development, Industry Outreach and Innovation, and Ven Vanessa is an Industry Relations and Innovation Analyst. If you missed any of our recent presentations, you can find them on the Scripps Technical Forum playlist on the Scripps Oceanography YouTube channel. Please know that today's presentation is being recorded. You all have been muted when you logged on in, into the conference. If you have a question for one of the presenters, please use the Q&A function or unmute. Today, we have, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Anders Tenberg, Product Manager and Scientific Advisor with Andera Xylem, and also an Associate Researcher at the University of Gothenburg. On, uh, and his talk is on biogeochemistry studies at the seafloor with an autonomous bottom lander. This presentation will describe experiences learned from the use of Gothenburg University's benthic chamber landers during more than 300 deployments 1,000 incubations in water depths from 5 to 5,600 meters. And with that, I'll hand it over to Anders. Thank you. I, let me see. Did I manage to share the screen there? It said, yeah, there it goes. Yeah, good. Okay, yes. Thank you for, uh, for joining uh, this webinar and thank you also for letting us uh, present or me present here. So I will talk about uh, biogeochemical studies uh, at the seafloor that we have done with autonomous uh, bottom landers. Uh, and uh, here is a little bit an overview of what I will present. When I say bot autonomous bottom landers, this can, could mean many things to people. But uh, for me or for us, this means uh, landers where you incubate sediments mainly. We also make uh, microelectrode profiles into the sediments, but we mainly incubate sediment with overlying water. And we try to measure what comes out from the sediments and what is taken up by the sediments and the balance between and the sediments and the overlying water. So how sediments contribute to the biogeochemistry at the seafloor, a process which is, of course, more important or relatively more important in coastal environments compared to uh, deep waters, because in deep waters, the, 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 the part which is close to the, to the bottom, of course, is much, plays a smaller role in the, in the overall picture. So I will just show a slide of uh, my background and experiences and then talk about the lander technology and uh, why we do this in situ measurements. Then uh, I will talk about uh, landers that we developed at the uh, University of Gothenburg and that we used for, uh, for many years in, in different projects. Talk about the incubations we do, how we do quality control. The development of these landers have been a continuous development and improvement throughout the years. And uh, then talk about some projects where we measure nutrient fluxes, for example. This is in coastal environments, in environments where we have a lot of eutrophication in the water, so too much nutrients in the water, which leads to uh, toxic, sometimes algae blooms, which leads to high input of organic matter at the seafloor, which then leads to low oxygen content if the exchange of waters is not so good. And then, uh, we also use the landers to make experiments, for example, by injections and by doing other things as well. And then I will show you some examples of where we use the landers on contaminated sediments, where they dumped chemical weapons. A summary and uh, then open for questions and discussions. But if you have questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate just to unmute and, uh, and ask your questions or discuss during during this uh, presentation. So uh, my background is that I worked about 25 years in development of and use of underwater technology. I worked on development of optical oxygen sensors, for example. I worked on optical PO, PCO2 sensors and a lot on these lander constructions. And since 1997, I'm a product manager or I worked at Andera since 1997. To start with just a small part, but then more and more. And now 
are mainly employed by, by Andera in uh, Norway. And Andera is part of the Xylem group where some of our sister companies uh, maybe are well known to you, Sontech from San Diego and YSI from Ohio, which we have close collaborations with in many, in many projects. We also work with other companies in the group. We are more than 17,000 employees in Xylem overall and all companies deals with water. So I know scripts uh, quite well, or I used to know it quite well because I worked there from 2000 to 2001 as a postdoc with Dr. Ken Smith, who is, you can say, the father of, of this autonomous benthic landers. He started this, uh, there was some pioneers before him, but he really started this as a continuous work and uh, he still works with this after all these years. And uh, then I also worked with Roberta Baldwin, uh, Fred Alman, and Rob Glatz in the group of uh, um, biology, benthic biology, deep sea biology. And I worked on development of a new lander when I was there. And uh, we did also at that time, the first measurements with the optical oxygen sensors. We tried them in uh, both uh, in profiling and in incubation work. So they were new at that time and uh, I work on, we worked on testing them at, uh, during, during that year. So in situ incubations uh, with chamber landers, uh, why should you bother? Why should you use uh, landers and why in situ? Uh, of course, uh, the difference is that you go out with your ship, you drop a platform to the sea floor, you, in, you insert uh, incubation chambers, gently into the sea floor, and you, you let the lander handle everything autonomously, make incubation, take out water samples with syringes, measure with, uh, with sensors. And when it's uh, ready, normally you send an acoustic release signal, it drops weights, it comes to the surface and you recover it. These deployments, they last for uh, anything between five hours uh, when sediments are very reactive or active to about two to three to four days when sediments like in deep sea sediments, Mediterranean oligotrophic sediments. But why we do it, it gives you much less disturbance, quality becomes much be better. Imagine you take up a course from 2000 meters or 3000 meters you will always disturb them, you always shake them, temperature will change, pressure will change, light conditions will change. And also we have found that with, uh, with the landers uh, through the years, we have worked out uh, quality control um, methods, which gives us what we think really good quality on the measurements. And we can judge immediately when, for example, the quality is not so good, when you have leakage, if you have shaking that you didn't want to have, for example, and actually it gives us less work than, than recovering uh, sediment course and incubating on, on deck. Uh, but of course it, it, uh, it means that you need to, uh, to um, make maintenance on these uh, tools and, and have them to work uh, reliably. So uh, when I did my PhD, one of the papers in my PhD was, uh, was a summary of uh, benthic chamber and profiling landers. And here is uh, the title of it. A review and in this this paper all authors uh, were all people that worked with landers at that time this type of landers were part of this uh, paper it came out 1995 the only one which is the most influential here was not which was not part of it was ken smith and i was so, soon come to why he is he was not part of this paper but some of the people who pioneered this type of work were part of this uh, uh, paper Al Devol, for example, which is in uh, in Seattle, in University of Washington, Kenneth Hinga, Rick Janke, which was at Skidaway at that time in Georgia, Will, Will Barrison, which is still working at UCS, Fred Sales, uh, who was at uh, Woods Hole, and Doug Hammond, that were who worked with uh, with uh, Will Barrison. So it's, these are some of the pioneers, but the real pioneer for lander work, as I told you was Ken Smith. And he didn't want to be part of this paper because he, he estimated that he, he didn't do enough work uh, in the paper. Although he was one of the people who contributed the most 
because you can see here in the acknowledgement of the paper, we especially thank him for, uh, for all the things he shared. And he also did a very careful review of the manuscript and commented on it. So he contributed, one, one of the people who contributed the most, but he didn't want to take part of it, in it because he estimated he didn't do enough work to be worthy, worthy as a co-author of this paper. So at this time, Ken, so his first Lander paper came out in 1972, and he's still working on Landers, and now he is at Ambari. So incredibly long career, more than 40 years, and uh, some of the things he have constructed, which he already did at Scripps, uh, uh, before I, I was there in 2000, and that was the crawlers. So uh, benthic landers, which can stay down for a long time and make incubations. Because incubation, when you incubate, you change the environment, you shut off the environment. So you can only do them for a short time and then you need to move to a new area. So here the crawlers, they change areas, they move against stream and uh, against the currents against the main currents and change areas and, uh, and do new measurements. And he has also constructed such devices uh, at, uh, at Ambari and still works on this, uh, on this type of, of uh, bottom benthic studies, studying the activity of the deep, deep uh, abyssal plains. So the results I will be presenting here today, they are mainly coming from a summary paper that we did, uh, that we published this year. And uh, it's about uh, our experiences uh, developing and using this type of bottom landers for the past 15 years. And I want to recognize here uh, uh, the leader of our group, Per Hall, who, uh, who is still uh, active. He's still leading uh, our research group at the University of Gothenburg, but next year he will be, uh, become um, Professor Emeritus, so he will kind of retire. I don't know if he will really completely, completely retire, I don't think so. And uh, Mikhail Kononets, who has worked with me for the last, or who has mainly been responsible for maintain, maintenance and uh, development of the landers for the past uh, 10 years or so, when I've been active in, in other parts and also working mainly for, for Andera. And um, and so after the presentation, we will share with you this paper here, and we will also share a recent application note that we made at the company, which talks about uh, this type of landers, not only the landers we have, but also some other landers which are doing incubation work. One uh, German one is doing incubation work at in very porous sandy sediments, coastal sediments, and have special methods for that. And, uh, uh, some others uh, are also from German groups and from, uh, from India. And uh, our landers then, we have made more than 300 deployments. I think today it's more than like 350 because there has been field work this summer and uh, more than 1000 incubations uh, deployed between five and 5,600 meters. The deepest deployments were in the Arctic uh, this is from one of the deepest deployments. The deepest one was in the Molloy depth, which is the deepest part of the Arctic Ocean. Then we have done <clears throat> quite many deployments on abyssal plains, but most of the work during the past 10 years or so have been in shallow waters. We were supposed to go on an expedition with uh, Will Berelson in uh, late this year uh, on a Scripps ship, but uh, it was cancelled because of, I don't know if the yeah, it was, we couldn't get our equipment there. It's a lot of problems with shipping, with containers, with arrival, and there was problems with that. And there was also other logistical problems. So, so this will not happen this year, hopefully sometime later when things calm down a little bit after this Corona things. So what we have on our, we have several landers, the main lander, the biggest one has four, takes what 40 water samples and it has between 15 and 25 sensors from Andera, depending on what type of experiments we are doing. Through the years here, we have we see that we have about 95% success rate. It always maybe some syringe that didn't sample that as it should, or there could be uh, uh, yeah, a stirring motor uh, which uh, stops because of uh, of um, or the belt which goes off or something. We had last expedition, we had a lot of crabs interfering with our stirrers, 
they, and some of them were just sitting where the be driving belts were supposed to run and, and stopping the driving belts from running. So these are things that can happen. And we have published about 35 scientific papers uh, based on the work done with these landers and many different, we have worked with many different groups. So they are all constructed of titanium and uh, plastic and, um, and uh, they have an inner frame. Uh, the big one, the big lander has four incubation chambers, as you can see here, with syringes. And um, uh, when we deploy them in deep water, you have the inner frame sitting inside here, and then you have what you call a carrier frame, which brings the inner frame to the seafloor. The lander lands, and the reason it goes to the sinks to the seafloor is that you have uh, weights, ballast weights on it, or weights, and these are of railway, we use railway track, they hang below the lander, so when the lander lands, it, it slows down, it never touches the bottom, and then it hangs, kind of hangs in the weights uh, above the seafloor hovers, and then the inner frame is released and slowly goes into the sediment, uh, inserting the chambers into the sediment, and um, then uh, you can see we have two acoustic releases to release the weights and uh, to to uh, find the lander at the surface if we cannot find it we anyway we track it with acoustic pingers when it rises or falls and then at the surface we can find it with radio flash and if we work in deep water normally also we have a, a, a satellite beacon on it to to be able to find it uh, after it sur comes up to the surface it can be tricky when it's icy to know that it comes up where there is no ice. So after the inner frame is inserted, incubation chambers are inserted into the sediment, a lid is closed. Uh, normally we let them ventilate for at least two to three hours. Otherwise there is a risk that you will have artifacts. And uh, then you close the lid, you start a stirrer. The stirrer tries to mimic hydrodynamic conditions which are outside which is uh, very tricky or basically imp um, impossible, depends on what hydrodynamic parameters you select to, uh, to um, mimic your outside conditions. And then we measure with sensors inside the chambers and, uh, and we take out water samples. We can also inject, and I will show you some examples of that. We can inject tracers to look at the nitrogen cycle, for example, to look, can inject, uh, Algae, uh, algae slurries to look how they um, break down inside the incubation chambers. Uh, there are many experiments we can do, and I will show you some examples of that later. So we measure exchange between the seafloor and the overlying water, and uh, here are the main things we have measured through through the years. Uh, typically, the carbon cycle, uh, oxygen, and total carbonate. Uh, we have also included PCO2 optodes uh, uh, sometimes. We measure uh, nutrients coming out or being taken up by the seafloor, dissolved organic carbon, alkalinity, pH, methane. Uh, that's mainly in sediments which are uh, with low oxygen and quite organic rich. Uh, we look at, for example, iron and manganese we have looked at in some projects. And then we have also measured fluxes on contaminated sediments. And there are some of these parameters like arsenic is an important parameter when it comes to mustard gas, dumped mustard gas, because uh, the mustard gas has quite high levels of arsenic in it. And turbidity we use as a, to look at how much resuspension of sediments we have in the chambers and we can create resuspension during the experiments by stirring more rapidly. So when we work in deep water, we have this carrier frame. When we work in shallow water, some, something like below 150 meters, uh, and there is not too much traffic at the surface uh, in uh, more sheltered areas inside archipelagos and stuff, then we use just inner frames and we lower them slowly to the bottom and let them go into the sediments. Here is one uh, incubation, here is one frame with uh, two incubation chambers. And uh, here is another one uh, which has four incubation chambers. And above here, you see uh, the logger, which logs all sensors. And so it's a, it's a SeaGuard uh, instrument, multi-parameter logger. And um, yes, 
So, and here, here is Mikhail Kononets, the guy who has been working actively with these uh, landers and doing a lot of, of experiments and measurements with them for the past 10 years or so. So if we look in more in detail here, we see incubation chamber again, uh, the sensors, uh, what we have included in inside chambers is uh, routinely we have uh, turbidity, oxygen optodes, conductivity sensors, and uh, we also recently include uh, pressure sensors inside the chambers. Why? I will show you why we do measure these things. Oxygen is obvious, you want to measure the respiration rates of the, of the sediments and the consumption done mainly by, by bacteria, but also by the benthic fauna. Here you see um, a chamber which after recovery, it uh, after experiments are done, it takes the sediment and brings it back to the, to the surface. So then you can look at grain size, you can look at uh, in fauna, you can look at, uh, for example, uh, you can take samples, subsamples, and look at uh, gradients inside uh, inside these uh, sediments. And uh, you see syringe racks here, ten syringes in each chamber, and a stirring motor here with a driving belt. We have a stirrer which we call Mississippi wheel. It's uh, it's uh, lying horizontally inside the chamber, and it's uh, stirring in this way. A paddle wheel and uh, the reason we have this is because uh, some many years ago we did careful studies on hydrodynamics inside chambers we made an intercalibration where many of the lander users came to our lab and we did uh, hydrodynamic studies on on the incubation chambers and uh, after that we selected this type of of, of stirring uh, for uh, for our chambers for our incubations and uh, yes, um, uh, we see. Yeah, so sensors that we use inside oxygen uh, and temperature, they are all have temperature, these sensors, uh, turbidity and uh, uh, salinity and temperature and uh, pressure. And uh, why we use uh, all these sensors? If we look here at an example of incubations done in the Baltic Sea, that's why the salinity is low. It's in the northern Baltic Sea, actually, with uh, low, lower, very low salinities, 6.7 or so PSU in the bottom water here. So what we do here, you can see uh, this is salinity measurements inside the incubation chambers. What we do in the beginning of the incubations, we this is four incubations running in parallel. We inject uh, millicule water into the chambers with that will lower the salinity by maybe zero point, depending on how big the volume is, zero point, uh, yeah, zero point zero five or uh, zero to zero point one PSU. And with this lowering of salinity, we can uh, calculate the volume inside the chambers by simple dilution formula, because we know exactly how much millicule water we inject, the syringes are calibrated. And we can, so we know how much uh, the volume of the overlying water is, and we also get a very good measurement or good control that the chambers are not leaking. Because if the chambers are leaking, the salinity will go back to outside salinity conditions. The brown curve here is measured outside, and that's the outside salinity conditions while the ones which are tracking each other like this, these are just measuring the inside salinity conditions. And in this case, uh, so we get volume and leakage control. And in this case, uh, the incubations run for some time, and then we open the lids automatically and ventilate the chambers, and then we run a new incubation. Why? I will come back to why we run several incubations in a row, but, First, I show you oxygen, and this is oxygen consumption done by the sediment. And uh, four chambers in parallel, oxygen outside, you can see how it varies here. It's shallow water, very variable. And, uh, but inside the chambers, it's, it's steadily decreasing because of consumption of sediments. And then uh, we open the chamber lids, ventilate out, and then start a new incubation. And, uh, why we do, for example, uh, four incubations first and then ventilate and make another four incubations is because 
we want to look at effects of sediment resuspension. So what happens if you have trawling? What happens if you have uh, strong currents which resuspends the sediments? Uh, so here you can see turbidity measurements inside the chambers. And you see in the beginning of the first half of the incubations, we're on slow speed. Uh, you have some turbidity peaks at touchdown of the chambers and then or touchdown of the lander. And then we insert the chambers and then we run slowly the speed, the, the stirring speed inside the chambers. And, um, and we have no resuspension for turbidity sensors doesn't show any resuspension. Then we increase the speed inside the chambers uh, and then to different levels. And then we look at, uh, we get resuspension increase in, inside the chambers here. The scale here is NTU, normal turbidity units. And, uh, and that, that we recalculate to milligrams per liter by taking water samples and adjusting the readings from the turbidity sensor. So that's why we run first one set of incubations at slow speed, no resuspension, and then we resuspend the sediments and look at uh, what's happening with the, with the different processes. In this case, oxygen consumption, this is just because we can measure it. Then we take the syringes and look at other, other uh, for example, release of nutrients. Will we have more release of uh, ammonia or, or silicate or, or other parameters because we resuspend the sediments? And then uh, for the past years, we have also included pressure sensors inside the chambers. And uh, these are ultra sensitive, which makes it possible and very stable over time, which makes it possible to measure, to get feedback that everything is working correctly in terms of uh, lid closing. You can see here, you can see here uh, pressure measured by one of these sensors during an incubation. These are tides. This is on the west coast of Sweden. And the tides are varying like this. When we close the lid, you have a pressure increase. Uh, then uh, we take out syringe. Uh, this is an injection syringe, which increases the pressure. The sampling syringes decrease the pressure. This gives us feedback to that everything is operating correctly. And we have seen now using this that sometimes it can happen that two Syringes, syringes trigger simultaneously, and that gives uh, gives us uh, with the pressure measurement we can see that immediately. Also, we have seen now that we can see the, the turbulence inside the chambers. We we think uh, with the pressure sensors, and uh, and we can see we we can get the feedback on the on the stirring rate. So here is just a detail of that how uh, how. For example, lid is closed, and how this increases the the pressure by uh, by yeah, zero point six kilopascals, something something like that, and uh, how syringe samples uh, decrease by something similar. The pressure. So uh, I just show you one example of of another type of of lander. This is uh, another type of lander which was uh, developed. Uh, by an Indian Institute, uh, National Institute of Oceanography in Goa, India. Uh, but it was built by a, a company in Denmark called KC Denmark. And we here, uh, Andera supplied the data logger and all the sensors, because here we have one of the Seagard 2 instruments that logs all sensors, because it can connect uh, sensors with, with the bus system. So basically you can connect as many sensors as you want and log them. So in this case, they have two incubation chambers. They have a rack of syringes. And, but inside the incubation chambers, they have turbidity sensors and they have one outside. They have oxygen sensors and one outside. They have salinity sensors and one outside. They also have chlorophyll, wave and tide. It's a pressure-based wave and tide measurement. And they measure currents with this sensor here. It's a single point current sensor. You can also have here a profiling, current profiling sensor. And now they have possibilities to add other sensors. Uh, they are talking about pH, for example. And one advantage uh, also here is that you can run sense different sensors on different time intervals. The logger here can do run them at different uh, time intervals. So uh, measuring fluxes and making experiments. Uh, I showed you a little bit 
what we measure. And uh, here is an example of a project that we had uh, uh, many years ago in the Gulf of Finland, which is part of the Baltic Sea. Baltic Sea is quite highly eutrophicated, many nutrients in the water here, and high load of, uh, of organic matter, algae blooms uh, and uh, blue-green algae in the summer, which uh, are um, nourished by phosphate. There is almost always um, excess of phosphate. Without, if there was no phosphate, there wouldn't be these uh, blue-green algae blooms. So here for a four year period, we studied processes and what was, uh, so this was just after perestroika, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed. To the north here, there is Finland. To the south, there is Estonia, which was part of Soviet Union. And to the east, there is Russia and St. Petersburg, which is the second biggest city in Russia. And also I think in Europe, about 6 million people. And uh, when Soviet Union collapsed, also agriculture collapsed. They didn't have any money for, uh, for, um, uh, for uh, fertilizers uh, to spread on the fields. So there was a large decrease in input from land, uh, but still 10 years after, uh, after this decrease, the phosphate levels in the water here in the Gulf of Finland was, uh, was still increasing. And uh, I, our hypothesis when we started the project was that uh, the nutrients were, and phosphate mainly was released by resuspension of, of sediments. So we did a lot of studies on that. We had several landers. Uh, we had our own landers. We developed landers together with, uh, with Russian scientists, uh, smaller ones. And we did uh, yeah, planar optode studies of the sediments. We did uh, resuspension, uh, critical shear stress studies, and a lot of modeling. We had two modeling groups working on, on the results that we produced. So we quickly found out that resuspension was not really the issue here, because uh, resuspension, we could see, only happened a couple of times per year. And it was not... Uh, very big levels of, of resuspension of the sediments. But what we could see when we did, so simultaneously as we did uh, lander measurements and so we also deployed long-term instruments. Uh, and for the first time we used optical oxygen sensors on these instruments. This was in 2003, 2004. And uh, we could see that how variable the oxygen levels were. These uh, measurements here were done at three stations, which are spaced out by about 100 nautical miles. One was here at the mouth of the Gulf, one was at the center of the Gulf, and one was further in here. So about 100 nautical miles between th these two stations and about 100 nautical miles between these two stations here. And when we look at the measurements we did, we had deployed these instruments here, current meters with two levels of turbidity, uh, salinity, oxygen, and, um, and temperature and pressure measurements close to the seafloor. And the idea of having two levels of turbidity was to look at resuspension of sediments and being able to calculate gradients. But as I told you, resuspension didn't play a big role here, but we could see that oxygen, oxygen variations was very, very large. So here are uh, variations over a time period of about one year, oxygen variations at these three stations. You can see the water depth here, 43, 56, and 56 meters. So about 100 nautical miles between these three stations. Still, you can see that the stations track fairly well, and we have really low oxygen conditions uh, in the summer and autumn and then uh, higher when the winter mixing takes place, when we have stormy weather and also uh, after uh, yeah, colder cooling, cooling down of the water. So, and really big variations. There was a lot of, there, there is monitoring programs here taking water samples every month, but uh, uh, we could see quickly here that these monthly water samples was not very valuable because imagine if you go out here and take water samples here and here, you will find that Oxygen conditions are catastrophical in the bottom water, while if you go here and here and here, just with a couple of days difference, then you will find that uh, oxygen conditions were very good. So this is the level here. So the scale is in micromolar and the level here is where you say that it's not good for, for animals, uh, for, yeah, for higher organisms to live in the sediments. Of course, there are 
can be organisms which are adapted to, to this. And, um, and uh, we, so we did a lot of incubations and we also uh, me measured in situ what happens if you let oxygen levels go low. It's well known that when oxygen levels go low, the phosphate and binding between phosphate and iron will, uh, will, uh, will uh, not exist anymore and phosphate will leave the sediments. So, uh, but we could see this by making measurements inside the incubation chambers. Here we see uh, during one incubation how oxygen uh, is uh, going lower and lower and here it's uh, zero and how this is phosphate from discrete samples with syringes. We see how the gradient, how much, how big the flux of phosphate is coming out from the seafloor and then how it increases with, uh, with the lower oxygen levels. But on the other side, we see that ammonia and uh, silicate fluxes from the sediment to the overlying water decreased when, uh, when we let incubation chambers go to low levels. So this is kind of an experiment you can make and look at when, at what levels of low oxygen is the phosphate really released from, uh, from the sediments. And by combining the measurements with this high, highly vari variability of low oxygen and, uh, and with the incubation measurements where we could see how much phosphate was coming out from the sediments at different oxygen conditions and from different sediments and combining this into model, we could estimate uh, how much phosphate was coming out from different sediments at different depths and different types of sediments. And we could calculate how much was the sediments contributing with phosphate to the overlying water and, and, and nourishing the eutrophication in this area compared to how much was coming in from land. So um, um, we, uh, the result was from this, uh, uh, from this study, which is also published in a couple of papers, was that the internal load, the load of phosphate coming from, from the sediments was about 66,000 tons phosphate per year or phosphorus per year, which is about 10 times more than the land input. So there we have the explanations why, in, in spite of a dramatic increase of input from land, uh, the phosphate levels in the water was still increasing after 10 years of uh, much lower input from land because it was stored in the sediments and released with low oxygen. So another experiment that we have done, which is related to, to this was injection experiments uh, and uh, where we inject marl into, marl is a lime rich clay, which is a residual of uh, when you produce cement. And uh, we inject that into the chambers and to look uh, if you this could be a way of permanently binding uh, phosphate into the to the bottom and uh, here we see examples of that de deployment in a fjord an oxic fjord at the bottom of, of about 100 meters and uh, control is uh, is the blue uh, where we see phosphate coming out from the sediments uh, no control is the red where we see phosphate so there was six six incubations for control and, um, and you can see that the levels of, uh, of phosphate coming out from the sediments are much higher than compared to the incubations where we injected more. So this uh, could, could uh, yeah, with this we could uh, make experiments and show how much uh, more, yeah, how much you could bind with this more. Uh, if you put that on the seafloor uh, to bind sediment, uh, bind phosphate uh, permanently. Then we have done several studies on contaminated sediments. And um, here is one example from, we have done it on outside the uh, paper pulp factories in the north of the Baltic Sea. But here is examples of uh, where we look at uh, contaminated sediments from dump sites of, uh, of, of chemical weapons. After the Second World War, there was a lot of um, chemical weapons, mainly mustard gas, but also nerve gas in Germany, which was never used during the war. And the Allies, Allied 
allies decided to dump this. So Russians, Americans and uh, English dumped this in different areas. And there is one site outside the Swedish West Coast uh, where there is about yeah, 13 wrecks uh, which were filled with, with uh, munition, chemical munition were sunk and, uh, and they are now, uh, of course, corroding. And uh, in this area, there's a lot of trawling. Uh, the trawlers, why they troll? Because there is a lot of structures and then there's more fish. So they troll between the wrecks. Of course, they don't troll over the wrecks because then uh, they lose their, their nets. Uh, the depth is about 200 meters. And uh, we have done have some projects here where we make risk assessment models and do measurements and experiments. We look at target organisms for contaminated sediments. We deploy instruments for time periods of two to three years uh, to get background information on salinity, oxygen, currents, and things like this. Here you see examples of that. And we have also made uh, lander incubations to look at contamination from the sediments. So here is examples of project where we made risk assessment model and um, a decision support system for politicians. But if we look at, uh, at long-term measurements, here are some examples of, uh, of deployment of instruments which measure currents, salinity and temperature, but also turbidity. And we see here peaks of turbidity, which were all related to uh, trawling. So there's trawling here and all of these peaks were related to trawlers trawling the sediments here. And, um, and they resuspend the sediments and we could see that on the on the instruments and here you can see the troll tracks and the brown things here are are uh, where you have wrecks and you can see one wreck here on uh, on a uh, acoustic sonar image and uh, and then the troll tracks on the side here and uh, to look at how high the trawlers resuspend the sediments we combine this with acoustic backscatters we combine turbidity with acoustic backscatter and then we get information on how high above the seafloor the trawlers resuspend the sediments. And this is about 30 meters above. So every peak from a trawler also corresponds to a peak in acoustic, acoustic backscatter. And uh, what does this mean? It means that uh, if we look at con the contaminated sediments, uh, we were interested to see if the trawlers resuspend the sediment, how much sediments they resuspend and where is the resuspended fine particle clay sediments transported and how contaminated are the sediments around here. So if we look at these are samples here, discrete samples around the, the dump site, which is this black flag here. And uh, so here is the dump site and the highest levels of arsenic, which was part of, of the mustard gas, to make it possible to use in the winter because it lowers the, the freezing temperature for the for the mustard gas. Uh, so the highest concentrations of arsenic in all Swedish waters was found here in the sediments at this site here. And if we look at the current measurements uh, from, uh, from the long-term measurements, we see that the currents are uh, towards, so this is progressive vector diagrams. It shows you currents are going towards north west which is this direction here so um, what we can see here is that the trawlers are resuspending sediments with uh, which are uh, contaminated to some extent by uh, by the mustard gas and it's spreading downstream from the from the dump site and uh, we try to get ban on trawling here together with swedish authorities but this is difficult because it's uh, not in Swedish national waters, it's in Swedish economical zone. And we also analyze um, uh, um, yeah, how to, if there is uh, remains of, uh, of chemical ammunition in, uh, in shellfish and, and fish and so on. There are, there are, we have found that, or yeah, together with one of the partners here, very Finn, which is the Finnish Institute for Verification of Chemical Weapons. We have found that in some of of uh, fish and shellfish, not high levels, but it shouldn't be there. Which so we try to ban trawling or try to inf influence authorities to ban trawling here, and they try to do it, but it's it's difficult. 
Then we also measure with the landers uh, and uh, at these contaminated sediments. And uh, here you see some examples of, uh, of different parameters. The main of interest here for, for the chemical weapons is the arsenic. And what we have here, we make incubations, the pink, in pink uh, triangles, these are uh, reference uh, chamber. We have one reference chamber where we have plastic coverage, so it's not in contact with the sediment. And the other, uh, so the green uh, squares and uh, blue triangles and black diamonds, they are from incubation chambers, from free parallel incubation chambers. So we see that clearly there is quite high levels of quite high fluxes of arsenic coming out from the from the sediments. So with this, I would like to summarize uh, the talk here and. Uh, we have, uh, we have talked about uh, autonomous bottom landers, and uh, we are convinced that these are good tools to study processes and make experiments at the seafloor. They, they give you high quality, consistent results, and uh, uh, by combining sensors, we get the really good quality assurance, and we do injections and uh, we do syringe sampling. And a uh, uh, good combination, uh, Good to combine these uh, short measurements with the landers with long-term monitoring, uh, what, like we did in several several projects, and um, resuspension. From some of the papers we published, we can we found out that resuspension mainly plays a role in oxygen consumption, but has not been so important. What we can see for for release of nutrients, for example, from from sediments. And uh, yeah, phosphate release in the Baltic Sea and maybe in many other areas is mainly governed by oxygen variations. And uh, yeah, we also saw some experiments with injection of MAR to bind phosphorus. And we could measure fluxes of arsenic from, uh, from contaminated sediments, contaminated by chemical weapons. So finally, I just want to show you one slide on uh, news new technology that uh, we released from Andorra this year uh, and uh, including um, we have uh, a new wave of, we have improved algorithms on our ultra sensitive wave and tide and pressure sensor which makes it possible to detect waves from 40 meters we produce three different types of uh, wave measurements one for buoys uh, accelerometer based acoustic profiling based and also uh, pressure-based uh, wave uh, measurements. Uh, we have new foils on our uh, on our sensors for oxygen, which makes them about a factor of two to three more stable. Uh, this is not a standard yet. We are still uh, qualifying uh, the how they work. We know they work well on shallow water in shallow waters because we have have thousands of such sensors with these new foils in. Uh, in shallow waters, but we also want to see how they perform in deep waters. And uh, we also see not only are they more stable, they have less, they are less influenced by pressure and they also have some other advantages. Then we have a new conductivity sensor coming out with much higher accuracy specifications. We just launched a new turbidity sensor uh, in that 6,000 meter rated and all our oxygen optodes now uh, uh, at the end of this year will be multi-point calibrated, even the shallow water ones, which are used a lot in aqua, aquaculture. We also have, uh, with collaboration with uh, South Korean uh, company, we combine UV light and, uh, and different sensors, oxygen and salinity, to have uh, anti-fouling, efficient anti-fouling measures in shallow waters. And uh, a new sensor also that we have been working on for, for about two years now. And uh, re just recently I was on a workshop on low oxygen measurements. It's a trace oxygen, which can measure nonomolar oxygen um, at the low concentration. So interesting, may, we think for oxygen minimum zones, but it's not so capable in high oxygen levels. It's to measure trace low oxygen levels. So with this, I want to thank you for listening. And uh, I don't know if you have maybe some questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. It was an excellent uh, presentation there. I don't see any hands raised at the present time, but I, I actually have a few questions. 
Um, you mentioned that the, the phosphate, um, uh, there was a reduction because of uh, uh, that, that farming wasn't happening at the time. And I, so the phosphate that was existing in the sediments that was from leftover from years of deposition? Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, mainly I think for the last, yeah, 80 years before that, something like that, when the industrial uh, agriculture started off, you know, and, uh, and also, you know, in the, in the end of the Gulf of Finland, there is, was uh, East St. Petersburg, big city without, at that time, uh, in the Soviet times, no, no water treatment at all, basically. I mean, maybe a grid to take out bikes or stuff like that but nothing to, to really clean the water. Now they have a, now they have a full, um, full capacity uh, water treatment plant. Uh, part, yeah, I'll be, I think 50% funded by Swedish and Finnish money, something okay. like this. Looks yeah, like so have... mainly coming from, from the sediments. And that's, that's, the, that's what we see in the entire Baltic Sea, a lot of phosphate stored in the bottom, bottom sediments. Interesting. So it looks like uh, Doug Bartlett has his hand raised and I just unmuted you, Doug, if you want to ask your question. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for a really fascinating presentation. I wonder with your lander systems, uh, a few things. One, um, uh, some groups, for example, Ronnie Glud's group at the University of Southern Denmark does really nice work with landers where they can take their oxygen sensors down into the sediments to get an idea of microbial productivity. Are, yep. are you set up to doing anything like that? We used to do that. Uh, we have had, so what they use is uh, micro electrodes mm -hmm. to do the profiling, micro micrometer profiling into the sediments. So we have done that with our landers. You know, our landers are modular, so we can have incubation chambers in parallel with uh, other things. So we have used uh, microelectrodes in some projects in parallel, but um, we are not, it's, they are tricky to use. Uh, you have to, Ronnie has, I know Ronnie well, I worked with him when he was in Copenhagen for, for a while. Um, um, his wife is an ex world expert on making these microelectrodes. So, so she's really good in, on that. They get good quality, you know, they break very easily and they are tricky to handle. So we never went into that path. But what we did was uh, we developed, um, also together with Ronnie, we developed uh, autonomous modules for planar optodes. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No. You know, you can, so you can take 2D pictures of the oxygen distribution in the, at the sediment water interface. Uh, so that, that works quite well, but there is always, you can get them to, to about the same resolution because each pixel is like a, an oxygen measurement. Uh, I could show okay. you, yeah. And so you can take a 2D picture of the sediment water interface and the oxygen distribution, and you can see how it changes, for example, with pumping of animals and stuff like that. Ronnie and did a lot of, of, uh, of laboratory experiments on that which are really nice papers. Then also, I know Bob Aller did a lot of several publications on that later on. And we, together with, uh, yeah, we made the first, we constructed the first uh, planar optode module for in situ uh, work. And we published a couple of papers, maybe 15 years ago or so, from both from deep waters, Sagami Bay outside Japan, and also shallow water experiments. If you would like to, I could, I can send send some papers over, but yeah, we have yeah now for the last years we haven't because there is always a discussion. We think the optodes worked fine, the planar optodes work really well, but there is always this discussion. You know, there, with the planar optode, you insert like I don't know if you're familiar with these spy cameras, which you use to look at the sediment water interface, just take okay. pictures, right. Uh, there's always this discussion, how much is the smearing uh, of this? When you insert something into the sediment, how much do you smear? Mm. And it's clear on these spy cameras that you smear the sediment. But what we found from the experiments we did, we can see also that we smear the sediment, but the solute, the oxygen 
does not get smeared. Uh, we also did some paper, one or two papers on pH with planar optodes. Um, yeah, but that's yeah. yeah, it's a good technique. But uh, we yeah. didn't pursue that path, path because we have so much work to do anyway with the uh, incubation stuff and uh, making experiments, injecting things, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the two D measurements you're describing sound like they'd be, they'd be very, very useful. Uh, another question that I wonder about is your system seems like it would be very appropriate for doing um, some labeling studies, for example, stable isotope labeling. Have you yes. done that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, we inject this label nitrogen, for example, to look at the nitrogen cycle. And uh, um, we also injected, uh, yeah, so mainly nitrogen, labeled nitrogen we have done in injections on. But yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, any labeled, uh, injecting any labeled uh, uh, substance uh, to study processes uh, it would be, works very well, I think. Uh, of course, depends on what, what kind of, of studies you want to do. What, what kind of uh, labeling are you thinking of? I'm thinking of, of C13 labeling. I'm, yeah. I'm a microbiologist, so it'd be of interest to me in some of these benthic settings to know who are the microbes that are so active. Yeah, and that would be yeah possible, no problem. Uh, I think and it must have been, I don't know who, if there are people who did, is, there's always, is there not always an issue with this uh, label carbon because of some radioactivity stuff or that's it's not an issue with that because i know oh. we had questions about that and then yeah not not with not with the stable isotopes so you know as long as you're not using something like c14 or, or tritium ah, yeah, or yeah. something yes. like that. yeah yeah but yes i mean the label nitrogen we have done yeah there was several papers on lab, on nitrogen cycle and injecting that and studying the nitrogen cycle with labeled Nitrogen, so it should be no problem with labeled carbon as well. Right, right, Maybe. right. It could be collaboration. Yeah, yeah, really powerful system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it looks like we don't have any more raised hands. So I just wanna thank Anders today for this wonderful uh, presentation and uh, everyone that attended and just say that uh, we're always looking for input on future speakers for the Scripps Technical Forum. So if you have some ideas, just shoot them our way and, and uh, we'll make it happen. Uh, thank you again. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.